there were encroachments on both sides. There'd be flare-ups and other crimes and, you know, within their communities, of course. But then when it was between the two different communities, that's when things got a little bit more complicated, but they ironed out those differences. And um, they had peace, like I said, for 55 years. That's not too bad. That's a couple of generations. Do we do that well today? Uh, you know, God never talks about different races, by the way, right? These are two tribes coming together. You had the tribes of the pilgrims, and you had some of the Indian tribes, several different Indian tribes that were there. And the Indian tribes had differences amongst themselves. They were not a homogeneous group that uh, was always at peace with each other either. And so uh, you have different tribes, you have different tongues, and that's the way God describes us. God does not talk about different races in the Bible. He talks about nations, tongues, and tribes. You know, Michael Savage talks about borders, language, and culture. I don't know if he got that from the Bible. Um, you know, this is uh, something that runs throughout the Bible. I don't know if he got it from that or if he just got it from observation, because it's true. It's true. That, and so he could have uh, noticed that himself, or he could have gotten it from the ancient writings. But it's true nevertheless. And so you know, God goes on further. I mean, we don't have different races. He has made all nations of one blood. We're all descended from Adam and later from Noah. So we have different political entities, we have different cultures, we have different languages. But we're all created in the image of God. We're all of one blood. That was how the pilgrims saw it. Uh, they sought to uh, help people with the Christian religion by spreading it. But um, we could look at that aspect of it, the peace and harmony of different tongues and tribes coming together to form a nation that's going to be greater than uh, the sum of the two parts. We could also look at it at the historical significance of the Mayflower Compact, or as it's more accurately described, the Mayflower Combination. This is the document that they put together themselves when they realized that they were out of the legal jurisdiction of where they were headed, and they didn't have anything to govern themselves. But it really wasn't so much a political document. It was a groundbreaking moment, a groundbreaking document, because it was the first time that people had come together voluntarily to create something that would eventually become the instruments of governance. Uh, you know, it is there as the foundation that was later built upon with the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and many other things. Here's what they wrote when they realized they were in a place that they had not intended to go and that there was no contract, no legal definition of how they were to operate. This is what they said. So just keep in mind what the American experience, what PBS was telling you. They didn't do this because of religion. Oh, really? Did they even bother to read the Mayflower combination or the compact, if you will? In the name of God, amen. That's how they begin it. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord King James, by the grace of God of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, King, Defender of the Faith, etc., having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith and the honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do by these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another, covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid. And by virtue hereof, do enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and officers from time to time, as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony, unto which we promise all due submission and obedience. In witness whereof, we have hereunto subscribed our names at Cape Cod, 
the 11th of November, in the reign of our sovereign Lord King James of England, France, and Ireland, and the 18th and of Scotland, the 54th. Anno Domini, that means year of our Lord, 1620. So the Mayflower Compact is America's foundational document. PBS wants you to believe that it had nothing to do with God. You didn't hear anything about God in there, did you? Evidently, PBS didn't. They have a much shorter document that they redacted God from, evidently, as well as from all the diaries and recorded history of the time. As uh, Wilmore Kendall and George Carey said in their book, Basic Symbols, the compact is a symbol around which both the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution is built upon. It did not have a formal title as the Declaration of Independence. It um, was referred to by the people who lived there and their descendants as not by the compact, but by the combination. Let me see when I was saying that. We do uh, hereby covenant and combine ourselves. And so they called it the combination. And that's how it was referred to by that community and uh, the people who lived there up until the 1790s. And then it was referred to as the Mayflower Compact. Uh, many people who look at that believe that it was, uh, that was more of a reflection of a more secularized uh, view of this. Uh, they could have called it the covenant, but I think uh, they, you know, were, out of respect, they would look at, um, you know, a covenant as being something that was more religious, so they called it the combination. Uh, but bottom line is that this is more than just about semantics. The combination was really about creating a society even more so than a form of government. The Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, would add more political theories and ideas and political structures at a later time, but that was really what it was built upon. Um, Israel is 5,690 miles away from the U.S., 11 hours by plane. Hate travels faster, in a comment, in a post, in a second. Jewish hate is up 388% in the U.S. Black hate, Muslim hate, and Asian hate are up too. When one hate rises, they all do. Let's stand up to all hate together. Share and wear the blue square from StandUpToJewishHate.org. Since 1981, Unbound has connected people like you with families worldwide on their self-directed paths out of poverty. A brighter future is possible for these families when we all walk together. Sponsor a child today, and you'll help a family take the first steps on their path. Change their future in just one click. Start walking with your new friend today at unbound.org slash walk. There was an interesting comment on all this by a history professor from Hillsdale College, uh, Bradley Berzer. He's a Roman Catholic, and he points out, he says, this could never have been composed by anyone but the most Protestant of Protestants. Indeed, even as a practicing Roman Catholic, I have a hard time imagining the same scene being played out by French, Spanish, or Portuguese settlers. No, this is one of the great fruits of Protestantism, and it's probably one that we Catholics should take to heart especially as we continue to struggle over issues of religious freedom and freedom of conscience in our rather fallen world of the 21st century. He goes on, he says, importantly, the authors of the combination never assert the existence of a, quote, state of nature, you know, Lockean, Hobbesian ideas uh, that came later, by the way. Uh, instead, they recognize that they are beholden to Scripture to tradition, to a hierarchical authority, and to the English common law. And yet, they were not prepared either to destroy these ties nor to leave them out completely. Instead, they looked out upon what they considered to be a virgin land, a promised land of sorts. Here, they could take the best of the past, but they could implement it as they so desired. Wouldn't it be good 
if we were to do the same thing today. All around the world, we have statues being destroyed, monuments being destroyed. The foundations of our society are being destroyed by Marxists who look for any imperfection or hypocrisy in the lives of the people who laid down the foundations of our society in order to destroy our society. The wise path is to always take the good aspects of what went before us. Eat the chicken and leave the bone, if you will. You know, you can take a look at Martin Luther King, for example, and you could focus on his plagiarism. You could focus on his infidelities. You could focus on what many people have pointed out are some socialist tendencies of himself. Or you could take a look at his speeches, his inspirational speeches, where he said we should judge people by the content of their character rather than the color of their skin. Wouldn't that be nice if we were to do that today? That is antithetical to what the left wants to do today. So we take the best from people. Uh, We uh, try to ignore the imperfections that are always there, whether you're talking about Martin Luther King or Thomas Jefferson. Uh, We try to ignore those perfections and take the wisdom from their life, learn the lessons from their life. That's what we ought to do, but uh, we don't do that. Uh, so he goes on to say he was um, at Hillsdale College. He always likes to uh, do a, a lecture on uh, the Mayflower combination. He says, as I prepared the lecture, I racked my brain trying to remember an example of another earlier assertion of self-government. Had the Greeks done it or the Jews? No, they had already relied upon a law giver. The Romans asserted something in 509 B.C., but I'm not sure that it had quite the same texture as what the pilgrims did in 1620. I really couldn't come up with a significant example. For all intents and purposes, the Plymouth Combination is the first real assertion of the right of self-governance in the modern Western world and one of the most important in any time or place. As Kendall and Carey wisely claim, the 1620 document did not need to assert any rights overtly as rights. Instead, the very short paragraph, the document as a whole, is an assertion of the right. It is a basic symbol indeed. That's the name of their book, Basic Symbols. So, It drew on the religious roots of America that can be seen in the Pilgrims and the Mayflower Combination. Uh, Did the Constitution, you know, the Constitution begins, we the people, and then it goes into the purpose of the Constitution. One of the key ones is to secure the blessings of liberty for ourselves and our prosperity. You know, atheists don't talk about blessings. You won't see PBS talking about blessings. <laughs> uh, not at all. Uh, a blessing is something that is given. Who gives it? We have an inscription on the Liberty Bell. It's inscribed with Leviticus 25.10. And it reads, Proclaim liberty throughout the land to all inhabitants thereof. Now, the context there, of what was being talked about in Leviticus 25, the context was about the year of Jubilee. Every you know, 50th year, they would have uh, all debts would be canceled. All the indentured slaves, indentured servants, however you want to call it, would be set free. It was a year of Jubilee. And that, was, that inscription uh, was put on the Liberty Bell. Founders of America from 1620 to the creation of the Constitution saw liberty as a blessing, as a gift from God. They made it clear over and over again. And the second half of that, to ourselves and to our posterity. posterity. Uh, So when we look at the pilgrims, when we look at the founders of this nation, they were very different in their perspective than our society is today. They were focused on their children. Their hearts were turned 
to their children. And in the 